Anyway, we've got, uh, is it Johanan? Johanan. Johanan in California. How you doing? Hi. Um, I was going to comment on, I mean, you guys have seen many theistic arguments, I'm sure, but have you taken into consideration uh, idealism? Well, I've considered all kinds of things, but you'll have to go into detail right. what you I mean. Two basic arguments for this. Uh, actually, I was invited out, out to California by uh, J.P. Moreland because he was just so excited about this. But um, the first is a philosophic argument. The second is a you know, very simple philosophic argument. The second one is from physics. Um, and the philosophic one pretty much stems from philosophy of mind, and I'm pretty fairly certain both of you will agree with the first premise, which is that dualism, is, substance dualism, is false due to the interaction problem, right? You know, well, you know, so, so I, don't go, I don't go so far as to assert that substance dualism is false. I just do not believe that it's true. Hopefully, okay. hopefully you'll the, get that distinction. The second one is that uh, you look at the, the arguments from philosophy of mind, and they're pretty strong. I mean, there's, there's numerous ones you can do. There's uh, Kripke's argument, uh, Mary the Color Scientist, pointing is EAN. Yep. You can use uh, Cartesian skepticism to arrive at another one, and so on and so forth. And there's, there's a lot of good cases to be made that the mind is immaterial. And then when you look on the other side of it, a lot of the materialist models of the mind really don't make much sense. Like, um, eliminativism tries to get rid of consciousness entirely. Functionalism says the mind is a, a process, which is kind of strange because you're talking about your own subject being a, an action rather than a thing. Well, no, the, the fact that we don't necessarily have use language properly to describe it is not a defeater for the position. When we're just getting when we're just getting to where we understand the mind, of course we're going to refer to ourselves and we're going to say things like my mind, my brain. Uh, don't let the language, you know, inhibit our ability to understand what's actually going on. I view the mind as a function of the brain. I know, I know. Well, well, the thing with that is, is that it it's not just about the language. The language reflects our original experience and so you, you, the first thing you know in the world is your own your own mind exists you yeah it, it reflects our perception but that doesn't mean our perception is accurate or our ability to describe it is accurate right but there has to be at some level a very basic level of perception which has to be accurate otherwise which, which then forms the foundation of all of our subsequent knowledge like uh, you know Cartesian skepticism right Descartes doubts everything he can in the world and then which is this fundamental foundation, then everything else derives from that. And well, in, in that particular case, the fundamental well, foundation... So I don't, I don't see that there's a bridge for that. There's just basically a presupposition that's a kind of a pragmatic... But you have to, I mean, you can't, you can't really ground knowledge. I mean, even, you, you, know, so you say it is a presupposition, right? Yeah. You still have to have something like that to ground any sort of knowledge, which even include the, the ground is the ground is the presupposition. But how does this get us to an argument for for deism or theism? Okay, so the mind is immaterial. Dualism is false. I, I'm not saying the mind is immaterial. I, I'm, I'm not sure that the mind is something that actually. I'm giving the argument. Okay, I, I know. I know you don't believe that. Okay, we'll get to that later. It, it, well, so it, it always, it, and I'll let you finish, but I mean, it's just another one of those examples where we're going to begin an argument with a premise that I reject. Well, you already accept one premise, and we'll get to the, so the whole argument hinges on the second premise. Only no, 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 no. <laughs> no argument hinges on the second premise. If it's got two premises and you reject the first one, the argument's dead. No, no, you, you accept the first one. The first one was that dualism is false. No, right. actually, he said it's not true. You believe it was false. You don't believe it, though. I don't accept that dualism is true, but go ahead. Okay, so we both we're both honest, and the second then premise is that the mind is immaterial. Now, okay, I reject mind, that premise. You reject that premise, but if so, the, everything hinges on that one premise. Uh, now, if that premise is true, though, then the only substance in existence is mind. So, therefore, if mind is immaterial, it therefore follows automatically that idealism is also true, right? So, if somebody comes up to you with an argument, and you reject one of the premises, why would you bother continuing? Well, we, we, we could further discuss the premise you reject. Now, I was going to bring a second argument in, very briefly, that would kind of go into a, or take, or put, put out a take on all this, which I think would really change the perception of things, okay? Um, in the quantum gravity right now, I'm back with physics, and so I familiar with this. In the field of quantum gravity, uh, right now, researchers are discovering that what we refer to as time is emergent. 
Now, space-time is the ground of physical reality. When you talk about something being physical, you're talking about matter or energy existing in space-time. Am I right? I suppose so. Okay. Now, if space which is what everyone Are you saying. mutt wrestling a walrus or something in there? Because I can't hear you. The microphone's <laughs> going all over the place. Sorry. Is it better? Okay, uh, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, just a couple of quotes on this. Uh, this was Einstein didn't know how to develop the theory of time, but he knew where the theory lay. So, so you're failing miserably. I don't care about quotes. Like, all right. Just what is the problem. what is the point? Can we get to the point? Yeah. Bottom line is, you're saying that physical reality is emergent, which means that whatever it emerges from is necessarily non-physical, and in particular, we can now quantify it. And what it is is, it's actually Sean Carroll wrote a blog on this recently. Um, what it emerges from is entangled quantum information. Now, when you go over to cognitive science, this is from my home state in Wisconsin, uh, there's a, a researcher called Julia Tononi, and he has the world's most popular cognitive science model currently. It's called integrated information theory. Now, in um, conscious as integrated information, a provisional manifesto in foot, uh, footnote 14, he states that quantum entanglement and integrated information, to the extent that one cannot perturb two elements independently, they are informationally one. So what he's saying here is that entangled states are integrated information states, which are conscious states. But now, given the physics, which is coming on consensus at this point, space-time emerges from entangled information. So it therefore follows that space-time emerges from integrated information, which means space-time emerges from the conscious state. So you have physical reality, physical space-time, everything inside of it, emerging from a non deeper non-physical reality, and that non-physical reality is consciousness. Now, when I sent this to Sean Carroll, Interesting enough, you can actually have a, a good response to that. I, I don't understand IT well enough to say, but entanglement is ubiquitous to many in many physical systems. Wait, so you sent this all to Sean Carroll and he replied? Yeah, he replied. It was fascinating because he he didn't he didn't know what to say. He was um, I mean he, he's not a cognitive scientist, obviously, but given the cognitive science, uh, Tononi is you know one of the world's foremost cognitive science researchers it would automatically follow from Carroll's physics that space-time emerges from a conscious state. Um, I guess good luck with that, and let us know when you publish something in a peer-reviewed journal that oh, I'll give you some documents peer that. Um, I'll give you some peer-reviewed journals. Um, I, I don't want them. What? What? I don't want them. You, you, you said you were curious about this, right? I mean, was, no, I, I'm actually bored beyond belief, but you can email us if you want to. This is, I mean, you guys, you guys have the atheist experience. You guys got you guys a call for theists to come in and... Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm going to give you experimental what, what, evidence. What, yeah. what could your argument, how could your argument in any way prove there's a God? Well, if, if the universe is contained within a mind... If the universe is contained within a mind, if we could conclude that, which I can't, don't for a second think that we yeah. can or think you've done, universe, but, then yeah. the con but then the conclusion would be that the universe is contained in a mind. How does that get you to a god? Okay, well, it's pretty simple. A god is defined as an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent being. Right? Okay, that's, that's the god of classical theism. It's not required for any and every god. But your argument doesn't get you to omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. It just gets you to a mind. I'll explain how. I'll explain how. If everything is contained within the mind, right, a mind, it therefore follows that that mind knows everything in the, in the universe. No, it right? doesn't. No. There are things contained within my mind that I don't have immediate recall of or understanding of and cannot manipulate. It's not, not in your subconscious mind, in your conscious mind. Well, how does your argument get yeah. us to conscious mind anyway? It just got us to mind, didn't it? 
time is being literally simulated within this mind. Okay, these are okay but that, that doesn't get us a conscious mind. That gets us to mind. This is the problem that, with that, people that, who begin with a, a conclusion and try to make their, their discoveries within data fit that. So you come up with a model that says, oh, well, physical properties, let me finish, physical properties are emergent, and they must be emerging from something, so we're going to call that a mind when I haven't seen any evidence that it is in fact a mind. What you've done is taken one definition of information, quantum information, and somehow equated that with a mind. But now, when it gets down to saying, how does this get us to a god, you say that not only is this mind, but it's necessarily conscious mind that is manipulating it, which would give it all the qualities that we would necessarily associate with a god, which doesn't tell you anything about any god anybody has ever believed in, or whether you, you, you have any, you're doing the same thing Craig does when he talks about first causes, gets to the universe, must have a cause, and there before it's Jesus. You're making an, an incredible leap. I didn't say Jesus. I just said a God. Yeah, Sorry, don't, what? It, yeah, he didn't say Jesus. He just said a God. But no, what, I didn't but say you matter. said. Can you not freaking listen to me? I didn't <laughs> say you said Jesus. Craig said Jesus. You're making a, a, a similar leap from information to conscious mind that I'm going to call God. And Craig is making a leap from must have been a first cause to Jesus. Matt, remember, remember I said before this was Tononi from he was he, he's describing conscious states, not like unconscious states. This is actually in he has like a whole theory called integrated information theory as a way of mathematically describing this these conscious states. And yeah, so how do you demonstrate that it's actually true? Because I'm not interested I'll, I'll in mathematical that. models. I'll demonstrate that too. Uh, what, what if this would follow? Uh, you know, consciousness would be. In entanglement, right? Well, I don't know that that follows at all. We have experiments on this, okay? You there? Yes, we're here. Um, if you have, um, they have done experiments on this, and they found that there's something in the brain called gamma synchrony, where there are proteins in the back and front of the brain, and they oscillate in vibration with one another, okay? Sure. Did you find proteins in the quantum information? Now hold on. Did you uh, find yeah, proteins yeah. in the quantum information? Yes, we did. That's that's what really I'm there are proteins in the quantum information. There are, the, the proteins are held in a state of quantum information. In the okay. State. When this gamma synchrony is disrupted in the brain, it turns consciousness off. That, so so I didn't think the proteins. I mean, I figured the you know proteins are basically biological constructs. I didn't see how a protein could be a part of this. You know, it's quantum biology. They they find quantum biology. Quantum biology. Yeah. It's, um, Anyway, Hammerhoff had a, a discussion at a Beyond Belief conference, and he brought this up. And it um, turns out that this is actually how anesthesia works, is they will introduce chemicals into the brain, and it will disrupt the gamma synchrony in the brain. All of their brain functions are, are working, so whatever the consciousness is, it's not located in the other brain functions. It's, it's just the gamma synchrony shut off. So when they disrupt the gamma synchrony, which is a, a quantum biological effect, it's an entanglement of, you know, proteins on opposite sides of the brain. So let me just, let me cut to the chase here. Let's say that you're right about all this and that there is a mind that serves as the foundation for all of reality okay. and that this mind is sufficiently godlike to call God. Okay. What difference does that make to any of us? Well, and this goes, if you want to open this can of worms up, I suppose we can go here. You can start to derive theology, and this is actually a very fascinating topic because it, it gets into uh, comparative mm -hmm. theology as well, comparative religion. Now, if, if there, is there some mechanism by which we this this God manifests in reality in ways that we can understand and detect? Well, I, I gave you it's the the quantum experiments. Okay, I don't now, care. Okay, so, okay. Okay, okay, well, so I suppose we could say you, you're looking for something like a miracle. Right? I'm looking for anything, any manifestation of a God that could be detected in reality, because because if, even if I begin to concede the things that you, you were putting into your argument, that doesn't get us anywhere to a being that we can, in fact, interact with or know anything about. So now, now I'm looking for what is the mechanism by which the God mind managed to communicate intentions and ideals to us. Well, um, you want to give a personal story? I mean, how I got out to, to Biola? I mean, I mean is that, what, what, do you, what are you exactly looking for when you, when you say that? I'm looking for an example. How do you know 
what this God thinks or wants. Well, beyond the argument, it could just be panentheism. It could be a deistic deity, right? Right, and panentheism is a useless proposition about a God. Well, no, because it gives you an accurate way of modeling the world. No, it doesn't. Based on what? Based on emergence from, based on ADS mirror correspondence and IFP. If, if there's no, so we have to get to this issue of whether or not there is a being, a thinking agent that wants something and how we can know what it wants. Otherwise, its existence is irrelevant to us. All right. All right. Well, go on to how you know, how you can, how you can commune with it, so to speak. Okay. Uh, this study from 2012, on quantum cognition, and they found that your inner space, if you go your thoughts and emotions, right? Your inner space is actually modeled best by wave functions. And they had another paper in Popular Science where they're talking about how you can model cognition as a quantum field across the brain, which would be the wave function pre-collapse, which is how you model entanglement. Now, it doesn't work to actually just model it like this. If it is modeled like this, it has to actually behave like this due to uh, things like uh, the Feynman universal simulator problem. But I won't go into that now because it's too technical. But um, the point is, is this is models your inner space, and now if you I saw that movie. Yeah. What? I saw that movie with Dennis Quaid, Inner Space. Right. All right. So now here's a, here's a cool thought experiment. You can do this right now as you're sitting there. This cool. Is kind of intuit what I'm talking about. Okay. When you think of an idea, think of an idea. What are, what are you thinking of right now? Some. Some object, maybe, or to think of some some. Thought. I'm not going to tell you because if you can communicate with God, He can tell you, and then we'd have a really good right. experiment. But I'm thinking of an idea. A yeah, red hammer, okay. Got um, it, red hammer. Now, if I were to open your brain up, I would not be able to find a red hammer floating anywhere. Furthermore, well, I hope not. Where is the idea of a red hammer, or maybe more appropriate, where is the where is the form of the number two? You wouldn't say it wouldn't make sense to say you point somewhere in space and say there's the number two. You'd be like there's this you know you, you open your brain up there's neural tissue in there but you wouldn't say that there's the actual number two itself there. Normally yes, you, it's nothing but a brain pattern. Go on. Okay, my point is is you can't locate the number two in space time. So what? That's the same beneath space time as they're talking about in emergent space time. You're actually interacting beneath space time. Right no, now. it's a brain state. Yes, the brain state is an entangled information state in the gamma synchrony in the sure. brain. Sure. How does that get you to what a god thinks? Because that means that you can, in theory, listen closely and hear things from God. Okay, hang Whoa. up on this, jackass. Wow. <sighs> My apologies. Yes. So there's some interesting things in there, and uh, and who knows? Maybe we'll get a hold of Sean Carroll and see what he says about all of this. But um, what I, what I get there from from all of that is there's a whole bunch of stuff we don't know, and there are interesting discoveries being made. And what people tend to do is try to find a way to make these new discoveries fit what they already believe. And so here's the thing. Yeah, the, the book I'm working on is called If I Were God, and I talk about some of these things in there. If I were God, how would I go about communicating with people if I chose to do so? Let me tell you, if I was a God who chose to communicate with people by having them sit around and be contemplative and get impressions of what I might think, I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah. Because there's no way for them to verify or to distinguish between here's an idea that I think came from a God and here's an idea that actually comes from a god. That sort of independent verification is why we make use of the scientific method, why my results when I'm done with them and when I publish them are there for somebody else to verify. And what we know from the world's religions is that all of these people who are claiming to get messages from God, they simply don't agree. Oh, they'll agree on little bits and pieces, but they don't agree uniformly. There's no reliable mechanism to say, hey, these people are all getting a message. If we tested prayer, for example, or meditation, and one group of people, let's say Pentecostals of this particular segment of churches in Louisiana, all consistently got the same information, now we would have something to begin investigating, not to draw a conclusion, but to begin investigating. We don't have that. 
and yet people are willing to draw conclusions. Well, it must be a mind, it must be a conscious mind, it must be a godlike conscious mind, and it communicates us through thoughts and impressions when we're meditating or sitting around relaxing. Okay. I, I understand why it's appealing, but I don't understand why anybody thinks it's actually true. Yeah, well, and there, there are obvious problems with, with putting yourself in a highly suggestible state and then thinking that a God is communicating with you. Um, we well, hear from the DMT on, people all the time. Yeah. Hey, yeah. take drugs and discover the real supernatural world. Well, how do you know it's real? Yes. It's like they have no idea how to properly set up test protocols. I mean, before we started, we were specifically talking about a yeah. science experiment that her son is doing and the test protocols and why he had to do it again just in case he made a mistake. And it turns out yeah. that he had, which is awesome because now yeah. not only did he learn how to do the tests, he learned how to check about doing the tests. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, I, I get that there's an appeal to this, but when we're just running down, well, well it could be this, it could be this. And this this idea about, you know, like we were talking about controlling as many variables in the test as you can so that you are only testing the thing that you're interested in and not getting, you know, other results based on some confounding factors. You know, if a 10-year-old kid can learn how to do this, you guys can learn how to do this too. Come on. You know? If there is a red hammer concept, yeah. and actually I would say that there are probably a number of brain states within my brain that are consistent with me thinking about a red hammer because there's a number of different red hammers I could think of. I could think of a claw hammer or mm -hmm. a rubber mallet type hammer or any number of things. And they would still be red. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's a concept that's encapsulated in my brain, which was the thing he was getting to. It's not like you could open my brain and find it. You might, though, be able to map my brain states over a long period of time because those things change too, and with a number of different uh, inputs, and determine when I am thinking about something that is consistent with a red hammer. Which means it's physical. Yeah. If there's a claim that there's something else um, manipulating this or that it exists to something else, we're almost back to the substance dualism that we rejected in the first premise. Um, I don't know the secrets of the universe with regard to quantum mechanics or quantum fluctuations or quantum information or what arises from what, and I don't think anybody else does either. Uh, this is a, a fledgling area, and you were right to probably contact someone like Sean Carroll. Your mistake was in contacting somebody like me, because I don't have the relevant expertise to rebut the points. All I can do is keep asking questions about how does A and B get us to C? And when you start saying that, well, think about this, you can tune in to God in your mind if, in fact, there's a quantum mind out there. You don't get to tell me what the mechanism is and have it be conditional on an if, because now you're just in, in, in the realm of confirmation bias. Oh, I think there might be a God. Let me see if I can tune into him. Yes, I got a message that I'm pretty sure is from God. Therefore, there's a God. None of that gets you to that. How do you write off delusion? Yeah, it's like, okay, I... I'm not a physicist and I'm not a, you know, a cognitive scientist or anything. But when you tell me that if you sit down and I guess contemplate yourself or whatever, you can hear what God's telling you. Um, I know all I need to know. Yep. 